so as Paul prays for those Colossians, and uh, as we look at that today, we got to remember that we are related to them. We're part of this same faith, the, the very faith that they held to and believed in and gathered to celebrate and to worship. It, that's the same faith that we are gathered here today to worship. So we're part of this thing. This is not just a brand new thing. The church is not some new thing. Uh, this has been passed down to us by the apostles and preachers and teachers for the past 2,000 years. So that's encouraging, I think, to realize that we are part of this ancient faith um, that has been passed down to us. So we're gathered today just like those Colossians were. And Paul's praying for them, and uh, we are standing for that same faith, and therefore he's praying for us as well. Jude says, by the way, that we must contend for that faith. Um, Jude 10 verse 3, he mentions the fact that we should earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. And that contending means to understand it, to, to know what it is, right? We talked about that last week a little bit, to be able to study God's word, to understand the truth of the gospel. And therefore, to contend for it means to be able to, to defend it, to propagate it, to proclaim it. And so that's, again, what we must do. Now, in the Colossian church, the church at Colossae, uh, they were being exposed to some sneaky teaching. And some, some, uh, Paul didn't come right out like he did in Galatians and, and call it a heresy. But it was enough to confuse the believers and cause some, some problems within the church. So he's going to be addressing that. But this idea, this teaching, basically was, was sneaking in and trying to say, hey, if you want to have an enlightened experience, a fuller experience, right? You, if you want more of this, this mystical part of, quote, Christianity, then all you have to do is keep a few of these other rituals and some of this mystic style of worship, and you'll have this neat, exciting, uh, further filling experience than you have with just that gospel that you received from Epaphras. So, so that's the, the, the line, and we, we're, we're in the same place, right? We have the same temptations, the same false teachings, people coming saying, you want more, right? There's, there's something, there's got to be something more to experience, a better feeling, uh, some kind of more, more uh, fulfillment than just trusting in the gospel and resting in Christ. There's got to be something else. So there's this temptation then to look for this higher plane and this mystical level, right? And that's really what we see, a little mix of Gnosticism, but not quite, and then a mix of Judaism and some Gentile paganism and all of this false teaching in Colossae. But again, it's true for us today. We are in a very diverse world as well. And we saw last week that we have this same battle, right, of people saying there is no truth, all truths are the same. If there is truth, you can't say yours is better than mine, and, and so forth. No absolutes. Well, Paul hits all of that. He reminds the Colossians that they've already received the fullness of God in Christ Jesus. And that's, again, he's reminding us the same stuff, that we have received the fullness of God in Christ Jesus. That means we can't get any fuller. We can't have any more kind of enlightenment. There is no other truth other than the truth that has been delivered to us in the gospel, and that ultimately is Christ. And that's the theme of Colossians, the preeminence of Christ, the centrality of Christ in all the universe, that all things are in him and from him. And our fulfillment to the max is in Christ. So, Paul lets them know he's thankful for them. We saw that last week. He's thankful for their faith in Christ. And he loves them. He's, he's thankful for their love for each other. And then in verses 9 through 14, which we're going to look at today, Paul lets them know his prayer for them. All right? And for us. So remember that. This prayer that we're reading today, these requests that Paul makes for the people of Colossae, He's praying for us as well. We are these people. We are of the same identical faith. We are resting in Jesus Christ. And we are gathered in this assembly, which is a local church, to worship, to, to worship God through prayer, through singing, through preaching, through communion. We look to Jesus Christ and honor him as our fullness. Okay, so keep that in our minds. Now, Colossians. Chapter 1, verse 9 says this, And so from the day we heard, heard of what? Heard of your faith in Christ, we have not ceased to pray for you. 
asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Let's pray. Father God, we know that your word is truth. We know that Christ is truth, that he is the word, the logos. So Father, we pray now that your spirit will give us understanding and wisdom that we may know your will as we read your word today. May you be glorified and honored and may we be transformed into the image of Christ. In his name we pray, amen. So as we see here, this is very interesting. It's a little bit of an indictment on us, the, the, the first verse, when Paul says, the minute I've heard, the, the first time I heard about your faith, the first time I heard of your love for one another, I have not ceased to pray for you. And when you think about that, that word you there, it's amazing. Who is the you? The you is a bunch of people that Paul has never met. He doesn't know them from Adam. He doesn't know them, has never met them, doesn't know their families, knows nothing about them, and yet he's not ceased to pray for them. So, wow, we are, we are called to pray, right? We're called to pray for one another. We're called to intercede. We're called to pray for our enemies. We're called to pray for the world around us. So I hope this encourages us to realize that prayer is an integral, vital part of the Christian faith. Yes, God is sovereign. God is in control of all things. We understand that. We rest in that. But he has ordained that prayer is a means whereby he accomplishes all of his decrees. We're part of that. We're commanded to pray, and God has actually invited us in as he's working, as he's doing his work. He is using us in that scheme to accomplish that will. So we're commanded, and we've got to do this. So pray for that neighbor. Pray for those family members. Pray for those coworkers. Pray for the world around us, as Paul does, even if you don't know people. He says, I don't know anybody in Haiti. I don't know anybody in Africa. I just hear about this. Folks, start praying for them. Those believers you hear about, especially as our brothers and sisters, we pray for them, not knowing them personally, but knowing them in and through the bond of Christ. But look what else here. Here it is. What is he asking for them? Here it is. I'm asking God, I'm asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. So we'll stop there. The knowledge of God's will, okay? We won't stop there because I want to read the, 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 the next two words that are very important. How do we know God's will? In all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And, and I like the, the NIV translation here of this because they go ahead and do what I believe that article, that word in is saying. It's literally the word through. We could put the word through there, and that's how they've translated it, that we will know the will of God through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Or as it goes on to say there in the NIV, through wisdom and understanding given to you by the Spirit. So literally, the, the idea there is, is very strong. We could not know the will of God as human beings without the wisdom and understanding given to us by the Holy Spirit. That's what 1 Corinthians 2.14 is saying, right? The natural man does not receive the things of God, for he cannot. Why? Because they're spiritually understood. They're spiritually discerned. So we must be, as Paul here, resting in the fact that the only way we're going to know about God and learn about God and understand his will is by the grace of God through his spirit, giving us wisdom and spiritual understanding. And there's a difference. Now, we understand there's a difference between knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Knowledge, that know-how, all those facts in our mind, that's one thing. But wisdom is knowing how to apply that. Understanding is knowing how and when to use that, that, that knowledge. But here's the point. We're talking not just about that human idea of understanding and wisdom and using knowledge properly. We're talking about spiritual wisdom and understanding. And that's different than fleshly. So again, we as believers have to rely on the Holy Spirit to, to read the Bible. You, you, we're not going to understand it, folks. That's why every time you pick up your Bible, just utter that prayer, Lord God, by your Spirit, open my eyes. Let me see your word. We're resting in the Spirit for the understanding to read a spiritual word, a spiritual book. And so, having said that, we understand now that when he prays that we'll know God's will, the only way we'll know that is by the grace of God through his Spirit giving us understanding and spiritual wisdom. But let's talk about that will of God for a minute, because that's a big word, right? The will of God. What is the will of God? How do I know the will of God? Right? How many people have asked you, how do I know the will of God for my life? Man, 
I've had a dollar for every time over the last 28 years. Somebody's come to me and, and, and called a meeting and sat down and looked at me and said, how do I know the will of God for my life? And I just want to say, you got me, buddy. I mean, I, I, mean, I know that sounds rough, right? That's my first response, my first thought. But, because it's such a mystical approach to this thing of the will of God, right? How do I know the will of God for my life? You mean your entire life or the next 10 minutes? I mean, what do, you, what do we mean by that, right? Uh, right now, obviously, it's his will that you're sitting in that chair and I'm here because he's sovereign. Here we are. So we know that's his will <laughs> right now. So that's a big, a big dilemma, right? Because, again, I think the problem is we have allowed that to be mystified, kind of a Gnostic approach to this will of God. And though there's this mys mystic, mysterious will of God for my life out there somewhere, and if I miss it, oh, my goodness, now I'm in the wrong will of God, or I'm in a different dimension. I'm in a, 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 an alternate reality, right? Alternative reality or something. But look at this. I pray today this message of Paul will cause us all to lose some of that mysticism and look at the facts of, of what it means to know the will of God, right? How, how, do we, how, how do we know the will of God? What is the will of God? Well, Douglas Moo helps us a little bit. I like what he says about this passage. He says, when Paul has in mind, or what Paul, I'm sorry, what, what Paul has in mind is not some particular or special direction for one's life, but a deep and abiding understanding of the revelation of Christ and all that he means for the universe. Okay, that's a little, still a little big, but it does at least point out one important thing, and I like, and that's the beginning part. That is that so much, what Paul's saying here is not so much that, 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 uh, God has some particular, special, specific direction for one's life. Now you're saying, wait a minute, we know people have gifts and God has called certain people to do certain things. I understand that and, and that is true. But this idea of saying, okay, okay, let's use it for, for this. Mm. So let's use it for a spouse. That's a big one, right? God has this person, right, for us. And we know, again, God is sovereign. He knows when I am born, God knows who I'm going to marry. There's no question about that. Why? Because God is sovereign, right? He's omnipotent. He knows the beginning from the end. So obviously, yes. But as far as on our part, we begin to grow into this, this, this idea of this soulmate, right? And even the world does this, this mystic, mystic stuff, by the way. And again, spirituality and mysticism is not a Christian thing, folks. It's just a thing that humans can fall into and be deceived by as well. So mysticism and spiritualism and, and, and this soulmate stuff that somehow mystically in the universe, the, the cosmic forces are working to bring two people together and those two are the soulmates and they've got to find each other. And if you miss your soulmate, oh my goodness. And, and because of that mentality, we have people say, well, I married the wrong woman. Nope. They may say, I married the right woman. I said, nope. You married a woman. Now love her. That's God's will. Do you hear what I said? That was pretty straightforward, right? Um, you married a woman, if you're a man, and if you're a, man, you, or a woman, you married a husband, that's, we'll get that part, right? We're not preaching a sermon on that today, but you married your spouse. And now your job is not to sit back and think, did I get my soulmate? Did I really get the will of God here, or is there some mistake? Here's the truth, folks. If you said I do, and the license is signed and filed, guess what? You are commanded to love your wife and love your husband. That's God's will. That's, that's, so, so let me bring that to pass as we continue here by David Garland saying this. He, 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 he helps us out as well. The knowledge that Paul has in view has nothing to do with some secret reserved only for the elite or some hidden key that unlocks the mysteries of the universe. For Paul, understanding God's will involves recognizing how Christ is the fulfillment of God's redemptive purpose and how God intends for Christians to live in whatever situation they find themselves. So beautiful. That's so true. This is the, this is the point. We are living in like God has put us where we're at. There's no, 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 no question about that. If you're here in Cincinnati, you're here, right? I mean, I think of Robert and Jackie who live here. They, 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 one was from California, one from, from Texas. They ended up living in California a little bit. They were living in Texas for a while, and now they're in Cincinnati. Why? Who knows? But they're here. And while they're here, guess what? 
there's a purpose to do the will of God, right? To live how they live now. That's God's will, to live for his glory wherever you are. The knowledge of God and his will is eminently practical. That's basically what I'm saying. It is not a mystical secret that's going to unlock the mysteries of the universe just for an elite few who happen to find or discern the mysterious will of God for their lives. No, the, the knowledge of God's will, as Paul is stating here, is eminently practical in nature and in its purpose. <laughs> so how do I know God's will? Let me give, here's, a, here's a good answer for that, for all of us. There are some, 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 some steps we can take to say, Lord, am I, am I going to do something according to the knowledge of your will? Which is a better way for us to say that. Instead of some mystical operation that, that God has to say, oh, now you're in my will, oh, now you're not in my will. Oh, now you're in my direct, here's something I grew up with, now you're in my, my direct will, oh, now you're in my permissive will. Hmm. Anyway, I won't even get into all that, sorry. But what Paul's saying here is very practical. And here's, here, we take those steps to, let's just even say, buying a car, all right? Because we should pray about things in, 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 in our lives, right? We are, we are believers who rely on our Savior for all things, right? We're trusting in God. We want to glorify Him in all that we do. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God, right? That means according to the knowledge of His will. And, 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 and so I, I'm going to buy a car. What do I do to know that I'm going to be in, according to God's will and please Him? One step, first step, pray about it, right? So this is going to sound like things you grew up with and heard over all your life, but it's true. We pray about it. Pray. Seek God's will. Say, Lord, uh, your will. You're, you're, you're my, seeking God's obedience. That's, what, that's the idea. I'm going to obey you, Lord, in all things, so I'm going to pray about this. We're going to buy a car. Give us a peace about that. Obviously, biblically, you read the Bible about things, right? Decisions. You, you, you're reading God's word daily, should be in the Bible. Therefore, there's principles of God's word. One of those is don't get in debt. So when you're going to buy a car, you have to now pray about and read scripture and realize what is, what is the biblical thing even about buying a car. Well, we don't have this much money. Therefore, we can't buy this kind of car. Done. Because it's not God's will. Why? Because it breaks a principle of the Bible, plainly revealed to us. Do not get in debt. Therefore, this $50,000 nice super truck, whoops, that's not our budget. But it might be God's will. How do I know? No, it's not. If you don't have that money, then that's called debt. And that, that, there's a principle about that already. So we prayed. We read the Bible. We seek godly counsel. You may want to ask a friend that knows the Lord, loves him, also reads his word. And, and just say, hey, we're thinking about this. Here's our situation. Get godly counsel. We understand that is a gift of God. That's what the church is for, right? We live life together. We get counsel from other people. So that's good. But it, once we've done all that, once we say, Lord, I'm praying about it. I'm reading your word. I see the principles. I'm, I've sought godly counsel. I'm listening to that counsel. You finally, I've shortened this up a little bit. You can also put your preferences in there at this point. Do you like red or blue or black? That's that, great. That's okay, right? We have preferences. That's fine too. But finally, number four, for our sake here, you pray, you read the Bible, you see godly counsel, and guess what? Number four, you make a choice. You make a decision. I mean, some, at some point, you've got to just pull the trigger. You can't keep driving down the road waiting for some clouds to form into Chevy right? I mean, they just can't, you got to make a choice, right? Based on what? On prayer, on the Bible. Now, some would take the Bible and say, all right, I'm going to be fanatical about the Bible and we can only buy a Honda because Paul and Silas were in one accord. Anyway, <laughs> so I mean, you know, obviously we got to be careful how we break that up and how, I mean, how we use scripture. <laughs> but I think, I hope, I pray you're getting the point here. There are godly principles in Scripture. We pray the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual wisdom and truth and, and guides us into truth. Our, our fellow believers who are also godly, and that is so vital that you, I stress that, believers who are walking with the Lord and also reading his word, that's where you get your, your, your counsel. And then make a choice, make a decision. And guess what? If you drive off of a Ford lot with a new Ford truck, that's God's will. 
if it has matched all of these other things, I mean, if you're not, if you're not breaking any principles of God's word and you have peace and, 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 and nobody's counseled you directly against that particular car for some, hey, here I am. I want to drive this truck for the glory of God. Okay. <laughs> Let's continue to build this up a little bit because in Judaism, in Judaism, the will of God was synonymous for the law of God. This is how simple and practical this is for Paul. As a Jew talking to, to this church at Colossae about knowing, having the knowledge of the will of God, it's synonymous then for having a knowledge of the very commands of God, the laws of God, the teachings of God, the standard of God. And when we begin to look at it that way, it makes perfect sense. If you, if you read that again then and you say... We have not ceased to pray, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his standards in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That makes sense. So what Paul wants them to know and be filled with is the knowledge of what pleases God. What are his standards? What, what, what is God? Who is God? Why is that that the Jews, to them, synonymous for God's will was his law? Because the law, the commands of God as given that was God. That's his attributes. That's his holiness. That's his moral greatness, his supremacy. That's what would please him then. That's really what we must know is what is God like that. To know that is to know his will. To know that is to know what will please him. So the reason for having the knowledge of God's will is that we will live a certain way. As you see in this context, we're going to look at it right now, okay? We're going to see this. Because the next thing in verse 10 that Paul says, based on what he just said, my first, my main prayer for you is that you will be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Why? Why do I need to be filled with the knowledge of God's will? And how do we know that that will of God then is very practical and not some mystical thing that, that I have to meditate and go to a mountain and wait for God to reveal it through some sign and wonder, how do I know that it's just pleasing him by keeping his standards and obeying him wherever I'm at? Because of what he says in verse 10. So as to, that's the first word, so as to, or because, here's why, here's why I want you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. The word walk there is a metaphor for live. Many translations go ahead and put live, and I think that's a good way to, to read that in your mind. The metaphor of walk, you know, we've heard the old saying, walk the talk, right? They, don't, they talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. That means live a lifestyle, right? Living a lifestyle. So this is it. God wants us to know his will and be in his will. What is that? It's in his commands. It's in his within his standards. It's living a life with the knowledge of who he is. And that's being in his will. And therefore, we walk and we live in a manner that's worthy of the Lord. Again, that doesn't mean we earn our salvation. It means it's fitting as a believer. I claim to know Jesus, therefore I walk in a manner that looks like I know Jesus, that looks like I am filled with the knowledge of his will. Colossians 10 and 12 then, kind of build that up. Because, because how in the world could you fully please God? That's what it says in verse 10. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. Wow, fully pleasing God? That's, that's impossible in our flesh. But again, if we carry this back to the Old Testament, the thing that would please God for the Israelites to do was to keep his commands. That original covenant, as John pointed out last week in our communion, was if you obey my law, you shall live. That means if you keep it perfectly, if you fulfill it perfectly, then if you therefore are in my will or in my commands, that pleases me fully. Because to fully keep God's commands means we're perfect, we're holy.
So how do we do this? So as to walk in a manner worthy, learn fully please him. Colossians 1, 10 through 12. Look at this. Here, here, here are the rest of verse 10. Bearing fruit. This is what pleases God. This is the, this is the, these are some examples of being in the will of God. Knowing the will of God. Having the knowledge of the will of God. What does that result in? Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Number two. So bearing good fruit, also increasing in the knowledge of God. That's something that happens when I'm walking in the knowledge of the will of God, being in his statutes, understanding his glory, his holiness. Number, uh, verse 11, being strengthened with the power, with, with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience. So having this endurance and patience through suffering, through pain, that's an, a result of walking in the commands and the will of God. And then finally, giving thanks. And I believe that it would be with joy. I think that those, those two last words should be in the next verse, as many translations have done. With joy giving thanks. With joy giving thanks to the Father. That's, that's the fourth thing Paul is mentioning here is a sign of somebody being in the will of God. You give thanks. You have a thankful heart. You're, you're, you're in the commands. You're walking uh, in the standards of God. That pleases God. And now, I'm scared. I'm a little scared. And I've been worried about this. So let's have a talk real quick. Because this is where legalism takes place in our hearts. And, and a message like this. So we're saying, all right, then if I have to keep some rules and regulations and being in God's standard, that's his will then, right? This is the danger then where the enemy takes us to a whole other spectrum, the end of the spectrum. And now it's all about keeping rules and, and, and checking off boxes. Folks, that's not it. Because we're not talking about just keeping these rules as the Pharisees did on the outside. We're talking about them coming from the very desires of our heart. We're keeping them with our heart, not just on the outside. So we're not just hearing things is that like a challenge last week that I give and I ask, how many know the 66 books of the Bible? My point there was not to get you to go home and memorize the 66 books of the Bible. I don't care if you know the 66 books of the Bible. The point was there's so much more we need to be studying. But we've got to be careful that we... Don't just latch on to something and say, oh, that, oh, so I better get that and all oh, 12 apostles, better memorize those. Now I'm good, right? Check, check, right? The point is, folks, we should desire all the knowledge of God's will. And that means we will be immersed in his commands. And where do we find his commands and his standards in the Bible, his word? So we delight in that. Spiritually, then for the believer, we literally delight it's not keeping rules to please God or to check a box off. Those rule keepings are coming from a heart that is literally head over heels in love with Jesus Christ because of the Spirit of God in us. And we have had revealed to us spiritual wisdom and understanding. And now we love and know the will of God, his standards, his word. And we, we, we obey for his glory. And, and just to reiterate this and to show that that's exactly what Paul means here in Colossians, it is just exactly what he said to Titus in Titus 2, verses 11 through 12. So look at this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing, bringing salvation for all people. Why? Training us. Here's what it means to have salvation, to be forgiven by God and brought into his kingdom. And now living according to his standards and immersing ourselves in his word, which reveals his will. What's his will? His standards of perfection and holiness. So we come to know Christ for the purpose of being trained to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. It's pretty important, too. Look what he's saying, and this is, this is wonderful. He adds, in this present age, literally what Paul's saying, here's the will of God. Here's the will of God. Renounce sin in your life. Confess sin and worldly passions. Live a self-controlled, upright, godly life. Right now, right now, today. 
Today, every day, that's what we do. Wherever we work, wherever we live, where, wherever we find ourselves, I can be in the will of God. How? By that moment, that day, making decisions with my life and living an upright, godly life based on the standards of God's word. That's, that's what he's saying. Again, the only way we could ever do that, folks, is by the spiritual wisdom and understanding given to us by the Holy Spirit. The, the empowerment that Paul prayed for, that's by the Spirit. But because of the gospel and Christ reforming us and his Spirit living in us, we now can live in the will of God. Meaning, we now can live immersed in his commands for the right motive. The right motive. And here, let's end with that. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about that motivation. To do this. It cannot be, look at me, look what I know. Again, look, this knowledge, it doesn't stop with the knowledge of the will of God, because a lot of people do stop there. Oh, I have a knowledge of God's will. I know theology. I know who God is. I know all the doctrines. I know, I, I, you know I, can, I, can, I can quote all these truths about God. But do you catch what happened right after Paul's talking about knowing the will of God? Why? That you may live. Our knowledge of God is only given to us or only important to us so that we can live it out for the glory of God in this world around us. So again, we cannot live properly without having that knowledge. So don't throw it away like many have done. Oh, let's just live a, a pragmatic lifestyle. Let's forget about doctrine and theology and knowledge. Let's forget all that. Let's just base it on feeling and being nice to people and, and meeting people's felt needs and blah, blah, blah. No, there's this wonderful balance here and it begins with knowledge. We've got to know God. We've got to know who he is. We've got to know his will. What's his will? His standards of perfection and holiness, his commands. But if we truly know them in the power of the Spirit, we will live them out. They will change the manner in which we live. And our motive for that is, again, not self-pride or building ourselves up. It's because... We're broken, we're humbled, we're amazed. That's our motive. Our motive is this love for a God who remarkably saved us. And that's what we see in verses 12 and 14. Giving thanks to the Father. Why? <laughs> giving thanks to the Father joyfully. Giving thanks to the Father. Why? Who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. There's our motivation. This is why I want to be in the will of God. I want to walk in his commandments. I want to please him. Why? Because he is the one who qualified us. So let's take a minute about, look at, look at all this glorious stuff in verses 12. Giving thanks to the Father who is qualified. That word qualified. I don't know how many of you run, but my daughter runs. I run to the table and, um, you know, stuff like that. No, but, but um, I just remember she ran the, 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 the flying pig. I started saying the Boston Marathon. But anyway, flying pig. And I think you can qualify, right? Yeah, yeah you can. And, and there was pace people for the Boston Marathon and so forth. And you have to, you have to earn that, right? You have to, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to qualify for a marathon. George, you have no interest in this, I can see right now. But at any rate, just listen to the analogy. So, uh, so you got to qualify. And, and it's hard work, right? She didn't, by the way, but, uh, because she stinks. But anyway, I'm kidding, I'm joking, just kidding, Carrie, I'm kidding. But, but it's very difficult, right? You have to qualify, you have to earn this thing. And, and many people do. And what a great honor, right? But that's a human idea of qualify, right? Do you qualify? Do you qualify to be here? Do you make enough money to be here? Uh, do you have enough education? Do you qualify... For, for this job, right? We have to meet certain criteria. We have to do it. And then when we earn that qualification, wow, look at me. Well, that has nothing to do with the Christian life, folks, because of this. Look what Paul says. He makes it very clear who qualifies who for heaven. We give thanks to the Father because he qualified us. <laughs> he has qualified you to, to what? Look at this language. Right, you have a Bible. Everybody with a Bible, good for you, because take your pen and mark these words. This is important. Mark this. Okay, circle qualified. Oh, yeah, Father who is qualified. And then 
Look at this. Underline the word share. To share in the underlying inheritance of the underlying saints in underlying light. He has delivered, underline delivered us from the domain of darkness, underline the word darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom, underline kingdom of his beloved son. Now, what is that? All those words that you underlined are what I call Exodus words. These are words that Isaiah the prophet uses a lot, who Paul loves, relied heavily upon. And what do I mean by Exodus words? These are the words used that by God through the inspiration of his word to describe his chosen people and their deliverance. The word deliverance speaks back to their bondage in Egypt. God delivered them from darkness. That darkness, again, is that bondage in Egypt. God delivered them. Those words are used to describe those things. To what? To share. That word share and inheritance are very closely related to what was talked about in Exodus and after the Exodus when they came finally to the promised land and they received their shares of the inheritance. As saints, and that word saints again in the Old Testament simply means that people separated unto God, his chosen people in light. Again, light was that description of Canaan land, that promised land. You were taken out of darkness and even the terms of exile, exile was darkness for the Israelites, and yet when they were brought out, they were brought out into the light. And, and, and so all of this is going to ring true for a, for a Jewish person who hears Paul talking here. But for all of us, folks, let's just look at this. What, what is this? It's very simple. We who were in bondage to sin, enslaved to Satan as our master, have been qualified, have been, have been free, have been delivered by, by the grace of God. And now we share in the inheritance that God has promised his people. We are saints because God qualified us to be, not because we earned it. That's our motive for loving him and serving him and, and obeying. We're amazed by this. I mean, look at the, okay, verse 13 again. He has delivered us. Do you see that? God who has qualified us, the Father, he has delivered us. He has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his son. Do you see the beauty of this is, folks, God gets all the glory for my salvation. Verse 14. Oh, no, at the end of, of verse 13. The kingdom of who? And this is very Christological here. This is very important. We get what Paul's saying here, how, how this whole book is about lifting up Christ as the supreme fulfillment, the all in all. There is nothing else we need. Christ is God's final answer. Okay, that's what he's telling us. And look at this. Kingdom normally is God's kingdom. That's what the Jews understood. This is God's kingdom. The Father has a kingdom. God has brought us out of this kingdom of the Egyptians and given us his kingdom, right? But notice the word Paul uses. He has transferred us to the kingdom of his Son, that's Christ. The emphasis on Christ now. And look what he goes on to say, verse 14, in whom Jesus, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It's Christ who is our forgiveness. It's Christ who is our redemption. He's the one that is our foundation. It's Christ and his truth that stands against all the false teachings that they're receiving. And what Paul simply saying is, folks, rest in the truth of the gospel. Rest in the truth of Christ. Are we resting in that truth? Are we living in the will of God? Do we now, I hope, have a different idea of what it means to be in the will of God? Do, are we amazed by the redemption and the forgiveness of sin and being brought into an inheritance, all being made possible by God qualifying us in himself and through his son. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of who Christ is. We forget it every day. We forget it all the time. We look at ourselves and the world around us and the philosophies of this age, and we are bewitched into following lies and fables and chasing trinkets that vanish when Christ is the fullness 
of God to us. So, Father, help us rest in your word. Help us read your word and help us live your word because that is your will. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.